We're going to get started now. My name is Bill Eginton. I'm the director of the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute, and I have um, the easiest task of the day, which is just to welcome you here, thank you all from the uh, bottom of my heart and that of our uh, colleagues in the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute for making your way here, those of you who are already here for, for uh, uh, blessing us with your presence and for coming together around such an important theme. Uh, just a few words about um, the origins of this, uh, of this conference. Uh, the, uh, the Grass Institute, I think, in many ways was created um, uh, precisely with uh, the goal of enabling uh, gatherings and events like this. I mean, there's many other things that we do, um, but uh, when Nathan and I sat down together more than a year now ago uh, to talk about this, and, and he immediately reminded me correctly, and may, many of you have noticed this, that he is going to be on sabbatical this, come, this year, he said. And, uh, and I said, yes, but Nathan, if we were to do anything, <laughs> just, you know, sky's the limit, imagine what, what we could do. And then and by my wheedling, uh, uh, we eventually got to the point where he agreed to put together the fantastic uh, planning committee. And, uh, and, and, and bring this group of, uh, of scholars and activists and, uh, and artists together uh, to have this extremely important conversation. It's that kind of event that we really didn't have a place for or a support mechanism for at Hopkins uh, uh, prior to the creation of this institute. Namely, something that individual scholars, uh, uh, faculty members, graduate students might think of a great, great idea, but it would be maybe outside of the, uh, the ken, the boundaries, as lim in a limited way to de describe by any individual department, the abilities in terms of finance. But let's think big, let's think outside of the box, let's put together something that really stretches boundaries, and that's what we're here for. And it's, uh, I'm so grateful, uh, precisely, to be able to, to be at the realization of, uh, of, of, a, of, of an event like, uh, like this. Um, some thanks, obviously, are in order, and I and, and Nathan will as well uh, thank some, some key people, but let me just begin by mentioning our gratitude to the provost's office, who really stepped in and, and stepped up and helped us out with, with putting this together, to, the, uh, to several programs and departments on campus, like the uh, Program in Race, Immigration, and Citizenship, the Center for the Newly Minted, I should add, Center for Medical Humanities and so Social Medicine, which had its inaugural meeting uh, uh, just slightly over a week ago, the Berman Institute for Bioethics, um, the Dean's Office of the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, where uh, many of our departments sit and where the, uh, 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 the Grass Institute sits, the Department of English, the Department of Poly, uh, uh, Political Science, Department of History, and the, and the Abel Foundation as well. Um, so about the specific nature of this meeting, um, as I said, organizationally, it's important to me uh, and to the board members of the Grass Institute to be able to support something like this. In terms of the specific nature of what we're here to discuss over these two days, let me state the, uh, the obvious uh, for a group like you, uh, that the urgency of the focus of this particular meeting on the humanity of a population that has been removed from the civic space of democracy at the same time as it remains paradoxically, perhaps, so central to its economic and political system. This seems to me to fit exactly with the mission of a, a humanities institute, namely to exemplify what we, we see as the mission of the humanities, to replace, perhaps, if we could put it this way, feel-good truisms about what the humanities are with the hard analyses that reveal real people and their stories behind comforting facades of law and, and general principles. So I'm now shortly going to be followed up here by my dear friend uh, and colleague, Nathan, Nathan Connolly. If you know him, you may know him all in person, some of you only by his, uh, his great efforts in putting this together. But he was aided by a fantastic team. And I know he's going to come up and say some thanks himself, but I'd like to preempt those thanks uh, with words of my own, namely insisting that the real thanks are, are owed, well, to him, to the tireless planning committee that includes Morris Speller, Morgan Sheehan, 
Sam Scharf, Aya Nuruddin, and Shani Mott, and of course, and perhaps most importantly to all of you who've uh, made your way here to come and, and engage in this vital conversation. So without further ado, I'm opening this uh, conference and asking my dear friend uh, Nathan Connolly to come up to, to say his words. Thank you. Good morning, family. All right. Um, my wife was telling me to take my scarf off in the back. <laughs> she, she always looks out for me. Um, I'm glad you made it, honey. So the, uh, the thanks absolutely belong to all the folks who were able to make it here um, for these one to two days. For some reason, it seemed like every major conference in the country is happening during this weekend. So there's Oswad in Seville, Spain. There's the American Studies Association meeting in Chicago. There are a couple dozen other places that people who would want to be here could not make it um, because they're there doing their conferencing. And part of the point around the live streaming is actually to try to get as many people as possible plugged in. And still, here you all are. Um, so I really do thank all of you for, for coming out. Um, as uh, Bill said, this was a very heavy um, and Herculean effort by a number of people, um, beg, borrowing, and stealing to make it all work in terms of calendars and other resources. Um, and in addition to the folks that he thanked, Morgan Shahan, Morris Speller, Shani Mott, um, Sam Scharf, Aya Nuruddin, um, who deserve mentioning again, I do want to take an extra moment to thank Dan Berger, who is here. Um, when I conceptualized the conference, he's the first person that I called and t tapped on the shoulder by way of Facebook. Um, and when things seemed like they were going to go off the rails last night, the 11th hour, he's the last person I talked to um, to basically help, help me out. So um, you'll notice in, in the program, in fact, that Dan's name is in the thanks scrawled in marker. Um, and the, the details and the hurry to try to pull together an acknowledgement page, I actually left his name off. Um, and so as penance, I personally hand wrote his name a hundred times in every program. Um, so that is my handwriting you see in, in the program there. So again, Dan, thank you so much um, for the work that you do and work that you did to help this conference come together. <clears throat> so that said, uh, my 90 year old grandfather, Naldi Connolly, likes to tell this story. When Young Naldi was just a boy. He lived with his mom and four siblings in the poorest section of Kingston, Jamaica. In the mid-1930s, that meant down by the waterfront, somewhere off Tower Street and among the fishmongers of Kingston Harbor. Tower Street was home to Jamaica's general penitentiary. It was three stories, Granddad recalls, and all red brick. At night, he notes, sometimes you would hear the cries and moanings, you know, man's inhumanity to man type of thing, unquote. Now, you can imagine the horrors of a colonial prison in a black, economically depressed country like Jamaica, just as you can imagine the nightmare that the sound of wailing men might conjure in the mind of a nine-year-old child like my grandfather. Even the most benign administrative records explain how the men in lockup off Tower Street were never issued bedding or shoes. Only so-called special cases got shoes or other perks of what colonial officials referred to as European treatment. That's an actual term in the archive. The 5,000 plus men and 50 or so women of the prison were routinely denied food as a form of punishment. They were also prevented from reading and access to education as a general rule. Prison administrators cited costs and the thorny logistics of outdoor gang labor as reasons for keeping Jamaicans behind bars illiterate. And of course, in a genteel, clinical manner that perhaps only British pension officials can muster, quote, executions are always carried out with the utmost decorum and solemnity, unquote. The grinding abuse inside the prison served as an extension of the predatory qualities of colonialism on the whole. The year my grandfather turned 10 years old, more than a third of the people behind bars in Jamaica had been convicted, convicted for the mere non-payment of fees. Not unlike segregation in the U.S., colonialism under Britain depended in part on the labor and cloying of the colonized. 
the cost of imprisoning an indigent people reached such intolerable levels that colonial officials recommended, whenever possible, quote, non-residential imprisonment, or what we today know as probation. The point then, as now, was to offload further the cost of incarceration onto the citizen. Britain's colonial office, it seemed, was forever trying to foist or cut the overall expense of imperialism. And according to my grandfather, at least, someone or several someones inside Jamaica's general penitentiary seemed to know this. You see, every day at dusk, my grandfather appeared outside the walls of Jamaica's only prison. There, as the red brick deepened under the colors of the setting sun, he would stand among the village's other poor kids. He'd gather alongside women and disabled folks, all quarantined in the slums off Kingston Harbor. With eyes up to the top of those high walls, they would wait and wait. Then, sometimes they would throw cornbread, he said. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. The cornbread was like this size and he always has his arms like this his voice lifting and they would come right over the wall the people would scurry to scoop up this raining food cheers would rise if a person managed to catch a loaf before it hit the ground not merely a house of horrors jamaica's prison nourished a population used to living off the leavings and cast-offs from the rich diet of white britons Obviously, the prisoners knew it was a fishing village, so to speak, Naldi explains. And we would just get these cornbreads. They were absolutely delicious. Perhaps administrators or prisoners were getting rid of the surplus bread, perhaps help justify what was being spent on food. Or maybe this act came from a single, intrepid, or even crazed worker in the prison bakery. Neither he nor I, after considerable research, know for sure. What I do know is that to this day, the memory of those flying, hulking loaves of cornbread brings a smile to Grandpa's face. For him, they served as proof that in spite of the nighttime wailing cascading outward from the prison, folks locked away off Tower Street knew the depravity on the outside was just as bad. As he tells it, the denizens of the general penitentiary with cornbread, redistributed resources from the miserly British colonial state. This was love from the inside, still fresh and warm today in the mind of a man nearly a century old. Prisons, past and present, do this same dual work for us all. They are places of horror, torture, racism, and extortion, Thanks largely to the labors of those inside, prisons are also sources of nourishment, intellectual growth, for some even places of healing. We can quickly consider, if not conjure, the nightmarish conditions of solitary confinement, sweatshop labor conditions, toxic foods, and 23-hour lockdowns. And yet, we also appear figuratively, as granddad and company always did literally, looking for and quite often supping on a fugitive form of sustenance. Put more concretely, we have all here been nourished by those willing to defy the absoluteness of the cage. Life Sentences, our conference on incarceration and the humanities, strives in part to acknowledge that debt. Much of what we know about the nature of the, and the workings of state violence, the interplay of culture and capitalism, or the redemptive capacity of Christianity, we've learned from people behind bars. And that's just you know, a, a smattering of themes among countless. It represents no stretch at all to say perhaps our greatest living historian, playwright, or literary critic is currently behind bars. So much of the effort before us involves supporting the efforts of those teaching and working with incarcerated intellectuals. There can be no question, too, that our best history, philosophy, or literature owes much of its greatness to the thought work of people behind bars. 
The list is too long to even begin to enumerate in full here, but we know it includes Antonio Gramsci, St. Paul, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Claudia Jones. We know it includes Chester Himes, George Jackson, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Angela Davis. In 1952, the historian, journalist, and activist C.L.R. James effectively launched the field of American studies by comparing the crew of the Pequod and Herman Melville's Moby Dick to himself and the other working people awaiting Red Scare deportations at Ellis Island. Roughly a decade later, Martin Luther King Jr. issued one of the most sterling and durable critiques of white liberalism in his letter from a Birmingham jail. White moderates, quote, tragic misconception of time, unquote, left them willing to wait patiently for racial and economic justice to arrive on the horizon, an eventuality that liberals' own silence ensured would never come. Through these and other debts we may never know. We must acknowledge how perspectives, intellectual approaches, and entire academic fields owe their existence and value to someone whose vantage point about American society and the world came through the bars of a cage. For this reason, Life Sentences strives too to recognize the work of those people who have fought and continue to fight to keep at least the contradictory or dual meaning of prisons alive. Many of the folks sitting in this very room know far better than I or most of us here just how hard it is to carve an even remotely positive possibility from the experience of being incarcerated. Life Sentences is thus happening for the purpose of bringing together present-day activists, art workers, teachers, and program builders. Our aim over the next two days is to share research methods, findings, and strategies for navigating Byzantine educational and carceral institutions. We meet to build the capacity of existing prison education to broaden the way forward toward mindful theorizations of state power and human subjectivity and to consider the place of the humanities in discussions ranging from prison reform to prison abolition. Such considerations are not out of bounds or even cognate to the higher orders of scholarly pursuit. Rather, the effort to get free has made our scholarship, writing, and art better. In the last decade alone, few fields have generated as much new research in the humanities as the study of the carceral state. Historians, literary critics, artists, novelists, and a host of observers in policy circles and in popular culture have taken to considering the dynamics of freedom and unfreedom historically and comparatively, interpersonally and existentially. Explorations of the carceral state have all but eviscerated the already porous divides between the humanities and the social sciences. The once gaping divide between the humanities and hard sciences has similarly been bridged by a focus on the social, physical, and psychological experience of state violence and confinement. The largest mental health providers in America are jails. The widest disparities between worker productivity and pay can be found in prisons. And incarceration represents one of the fastest, if not the fastest, area of broadly acceptable government spending in the United States. More, merely, more than merely beholden to a carceral state, we live, as my Caribbean grandfather did some 80 years ago, in a carceral society. Life Sentences, in sum, explores imprisonment and state violence as a site of social contestation personal meaning-making and innovation in research and teaching. It looks at the institutionalization of people and the fencing in of places as features of both narrative and historical processes. It explores, too, the ways in which people flouted the absoluteness of bondage and imprisonment, either through representations of freedom or through the active cultivation of insurgent scholarly and political practices. As a final coda, you should know that the colonial government of Jamaica found a way to end the surpluses in the uh, supply of cornbread and redistributed the money that was being spent on the bakery to the individual districts of parliamentarians back in the island of Great Britain. Um, I'm really looking forward to today's proceedings. I think we're going to have a fantastic set of conversations. Um, I do want to extend one bit of regretful housekeeping news. 
um, before we get started today. Um, I got a phone call late last night that Sadia Hartman will not be able to join us this afternoon for the keynote. Uh, she had a medical emergency in the family, so we wish her well. However, given the intellectual firepower in the room, we will have a what I believe will be a very robust town hall style discussion about the carceral society, possibilities and problems. Um, so please do stick around for that. And without further ado, let's commence with the program. Thank you.